Hey guys, this is Billy from AdultCello.com and today I am here to answer all your questions related to beginning your cello journey. So what we're gonna do today is I'm just gonna have a bunch of questions and answer them in kind of a quick question and answer format and I've categorized them into a couple general groups that should basically cover everything you need to know. So if you're new to the channel, my name's Billy and I'm a professional cellist, but I started the cello at 25 from scratch. So a lot of the questions we're gonna go through are questions I had myself and you know it can feel a little daunting to start a classical instrument as an adult it you know you feel like you're kind of on the outside of the club looking in and sometimes I you know I just felt like a little uncomfortable asking what I felt was a, a super obvious question how could I not know this but you don't know until you know All right, there's just a small handful of items you're going to need to start your cello journey. I'm going to list them now, and then we're actually going to talk about them later on in terms of how to use the equipment more specifically. So just in a basic list form of what you need to get started, you're going to need a cello and a bow, okay? And then other essential items would be a rock stop. This is used to anchor the end pin of the cello to your chair so that it doesn't slide around on the floor, okay? And then rosin is very, very important. <laughs> and it's used to add basic grippy stickiness to the bow so that you can actually draw the bow across the string and make a sound. Finally, what I recommend from the start is to get a metronome slash tuner. Uh, it's very important, especially for being able to tune your strings and, and check your pitch while you're learning how to play the cello. These days, um, it's no longer kind of a handheld device that's battery powered. You can just simply download one uh, on your smartphone. The one I use is called TE Tuner. I'll leave a link to it below. Highly recommended, it. it's great. Okay, so you can uh, purchase a special cello chair, which I actually would recommend because we play the instrument sitting down, you're gonna spend a lot of hours sitting, so you wanna be comfortable. There are a few guidelines, no matter what chair you use, that you wanna follow, just so that you are ergonomically set up to play comfortably, okay, without pain. The first thing is, obviously, um, you don't want arms in the chair, because that would just be very cumbersome, it gets in the way. The second thing is you want a chair that at the minimum kind of has you seated with a like a flat seat. Some chairs, they kind of recline back that they help you like sink back into the chair. That's not helpful for cello. Most cellists prefer to sit somewhat on the edge of the chair and, and we want to feel a little bit pitched forward, okay, so that we're coming to meet the instrument. So it's kind of like here's our body, here's the instrument, and then it kind of the two meet okay so if you end up sitting in a chair where you feel you know like you're sinking backwards you're going to spend a lot of <laughs> kind of extra you know muscle power just kind of leaning your whole body forward and gripping in your legs just to kind of get to the cello so a flat seat works and ideally pitched forward i find most helpful and most cellists do too that's why a cello chair specifically has adjustable legs and most cellists decide to make the two back legs just a little bit longer than the two front legs and it just kind of helps them just gently pitch forward so that they come to meet the instrument. So just to, if you're curious, the, the cello chair that I use is called Adjust Right. Um, I've had it for years, I have a couple of them, they're great. They fold up so they're easy to carry around and also they have, as I mentioned, adjustable legs which is wonderful. <laughs> the, if you uh, go with a, a just right chair, I, I think it's a great choice. If you just want to get that same sensation without, you know, buying a chair with adjustable legs, you can either put little blocks of wood on the back legs of a chair you currently have, or you can get kind of a wedge-shaped cushion, and that can just kind of help you pitch forward. So the thing about a cello and a bow is that in certain ways they're very, very strong and they can last hundreds of years. In other ways, they're very fragile and they can get damaged easily. So when it comes to storing the cello and the bow, what I would do is when you're done practicing, I would put the cello and bow away. Okay, so if you have a hard case, that's ideal. I would put them back in the hard case, secured, 
close the case, you know, uh, put the latches together, and then I would store the case on its side, okay? Not on its back, not on its front, and not standing. That might be, it might not be as huge a deal depending where you live. I live in California where we have earthquakes, so I just want that thing as low to the ground as possible so that if anything topples, it topples over, it's just poop like that, like just a little bit, okay? If you're gonna put the cello down just for a minute or two, you're not gonna leave the room or anything. What I would say, I you just put it down on the ground on its ribs, on the side, okay? So not on its back, it's probably obvious not on its front, but just on its side. And then if you're gonna rest the bow while you do something, just put the bow on the ribs like so, okay? Don't put the bow <laughs> on your chair seat pretty much ever because it's amazing how you just you answer a phone call and then you're thinking about something you have to do after you practice and you sit down and you hear a crunch that, that it can happen so just the bow is easily is just as important and just as fragile in most cases as the cello so you got to take care of the bow as well as an alternative to putting your cello back away in its case every time you're done practicing some people also like to use the cello as kind of a, a little room decoration because they're they're beautiful instruments the only thing i'll say you can get yourself a cello stand um, they have all types the biggest thing is make sure it's secure in the stand so that if it gets if the stand gets knocked just a little bit it's not going to just deposit the cello onto the floor and I would be mindful of what kind of you know living situation this stand will be in. So if there's young kids that are a little rambunctious or a big, really sweet, really clumsy dog with a really heavy tail that gets excited, those are things that could you know easily damage the instrument um, unintentionally, but it, repairs are very expensive. So be careful. When I tighten the bow, this is the button right here, okay? And I hold the stick and the frog in my left hand, and then with my right hand, you just twist the button in a, a clockwise direction, okay? And that's gonna tighten the hair. So when it comes to how tight the hair should be, a general guideline would be a finger's, the you know, kind of like a finger's width between the hair and the stick. Depending on the construction of the bow, that's not always super accurate. There's some bow, the way they're constructed, some bows, they look not very tight, but they're actually pretty tight. And on other bows, something looks too tight, but it's actually perfect. Honestly, what I think the best way to tell is that if you just put the bow in the middle, maybe on the D string, okay? And you just kind of, with your right hand, you just sort of flex the stick down, okay? You want to feel like the stick has some flex in it, but you don't want, if it's too flexible, if the hair's not tight enough, the stick just instantly touches the string like, pfft, okay? That's, that's too flexible. And if it's too tight, you know, you, you push and you push and there's barely any flex at all. The other big warning I will give is that all bows, all modern bows are gonna have a camber, okay? Um, which, which is kind of like a gentle, concave kind of u-shape in them as you tighten the hair it's pulling the two ends of the bow like this so that camber is reduced somewhat okay depending on the construction of the bow if you get to a point where there's absolutely no camber anymore and the bow is just completely straight across that might be a warning sign depending on how your bow was constructed and then if the bow ever gets convex so that's kind of like a little hill that's almost always a huge red flag and you have to loosen the bow immediately because that puts a ton of stress on the head of the bow and it's just not very strong there and it can, it can snap pretty easily, okay? So too loose is a problem. You'll hear a lot of scratching because you'll hear the wood of the stick actually scratching against the string, but too tight can, can truly damage the bow. So that's the one I would really be careful for. That really depends on how much you're practicing. If your bow already has a good amount of rosin on it, you know, just from previous use, I would say every couple hours of practice, you can go ahead and add a few swipes of rosin. I'll demonstrate that in a second. So having said that, if, for example, you get a rental outfit or you get a brand new bow and it literally has never had rosin on the hair, you're gonna have to really put 
a lot of rosin on. Rosin is one of those things that it kind of accumulates gradually. So eventually you, you just put a few swipes to kind of refresh that, that grippy, sticky feeling. If it's completely bald hair that's never had rosin on it, you know, you might have to spend a couple minutes just back and forth, just covering the surface of the bow hair. So the best way to tell if your hair is in fact bald is if you just, with your finger, you're not normally supposed to touch the hair, but if you're testing, in this case, go ahead. You can just kind of touch the horse hair or nylon, whatever the hair is constructed. It'll feel very smooth, okay? And, and you also won't get any kind of like white residue on your finger as you swipe. If there's rosin on there, it'll feel instantly grippier and stickier to the touch, and you'll also probably pull up a little bit of residue on your finger. Having said that, from personal experience, I can definitely warn you against having too much rosin. When I was getting started, it I'll admit I have a little bit of like OCD tendencies here and there, and putting extra rosin on the bow just became this like, I heard someone say it, and then it just became this like thing I would do constantly. <laughs> so even I'd play a scale, and then I would like rosin the bow a couple swipes, and then I'd try the scale again. I was putting it on like maybe every five or 10 minutes, not every two or three hours, okay? So that all led to my first public performance. I, you know, hit a chord and this enormous plume of rosin dust just covered me and was totally lit up by the stage lights. And it, I, it was like an amateur magician. It was really embarrassing. And also, as I got more advanced, I noticed that whenever I had too much rosin on my bow, you actually hear it in the sound as well. So if the sound starts to sound really kind of stuck or brittle or just not really resonant, it, it's, it can be sometimes that the ros there's too much rosin and it's just everything's getting kind of stopped up and gunked up. And you're, what you want is just a really free open sound. And with too much rosin, it, it can just get very kind of clunky sounding and, and the, the actual tone itself suffers. So just be careful of putting on too much rosin. So I'll just walk you through what I do. So let's say it's been a couple hours and time to put a little more rosin on the bow. What I do, I, in the left hand, I take the bow, okay? And I have my index finger kind of controlling the stick. And then in my right hand, I have the cake of rosin and I put the hair flat on the rosin and I'm gonna swipe from the frog all the way to the tip. And one thing I notice a lot of people do incorrectly is they, they don't like really sink the hair in. They kind of just gently glide like this. So if you listen, hopefully the mic will catch this. So I'm, and you can see the, the stick sinking down into the hair. So I really sink a lot of weight into the bow when I do this and really make sure that the hair is rubbing kind of vigorously against the cake. All right, in my opinion, this is what I was taught. You don't, you don't have to kind of like give a big scrub at, at both ends and then just kind of go indiscriminately. I think just four or five like really deliberate swipes will get you plenty of rosin. You can get as deep into this as you want and go like have a bunch of different types of rosins. You can just not worry about it too much. Here's what I actually recommend for most cases. It's olive by Perastro. Sometimes it will actually say for viol and viola on the box itself. It doesn't matter. It's, it's the same thing. I, I think it's a perfect blend of kind of grippy enough, but not so sticky that it, it starts to kind of get in the way. So I actually have um, a whole video on rosin already with a little bit of history and some further explanation. So if you want to check that out, it's right there. But in general, there's two very broad categories, light and dark rosin. I would advise towards darker rosin. It tends to be a little stickier. And for cello, we need a little more grip than violinists, for example. The only thing I would say to be very careful of is Sometimes in a beginner outfit that you would order online through say Amazon, you get a cake of rosin and it's basically more like plastic than it's like rosin. If you feel like you are swiping over and over again and you're not even changing the surface of the rosin, 
it might just be a really cheap cake. And instead of fighting to get any stickiness out of a really cheap cake of rosin, I would recommend just order like, you know, a five to seven dollar cake of rosin. That's that's like a name brand. It will change everything. It will make everything so much easier than working with, you know, something that just basically isn't really rosin. So here's what I do to clean the cello. I actually just had a, a couple gigs this last weekend, so my cello has plenty of rosin that I can clean for you guys. I have three items basically. I have some steel wool that I got from like the 99 cent store, and then I have two cloths. I have a kind of a thicker, uh, sturdier cloth, and then a very soft cloth, and I'll show you what I do. So first off, I take the steel wool and I just lightly brush the strings themselves. So it very lightly, okay? It's just getting it off. I've, some people don't think that's a good idea. I've, I've had true, you know, high level experts tell me it's fine to do. And honestly, it's, if anything, I think it pr promotes the life of the string. Um, so, and then what I'm gonna do, after I've brushed off and got kind of it loosened up, I'm gonna take my, my kind of thick cloth, okay? That's powerful and, and like stronger. And I'm gonna wipe off the strings and then wipe off the fingerboard as well with a different part. The biggest thing I would say is just be careful. If you just wiped off your strings, you might have a bunch of rosin caked up. Don't use that exact same part of the cloth to then wipe down your fingerboard because you're basically polishing the rosin you took off into your fingerboard. And you should wash your claws regularly so that you don't end up, again, just taking rosin and polishing it Take it off here, put it on here, take it off here, put it on here, that kind of thing, okay? Um, then I take my kind of softer cloth. This, I actually, my wife and I, we went to um, like a cloth shop and we just bought a swath of, of material because we were tired of just buying these little like three ninety nine dollars cloths. So we, we bought one swath and now we have like 500 little cloths, okay? And so then I just... With the soft cloth, you go ahead and you just gently remove the rosin from the body of the instrument. Again, the I think the biggest thing is the the idea of gently removing it. If you if you try to like polish it off, you could scratch. You're just you know basically just getting it off the the surface of the instrument. If the rosin stays on the surface of the instrument, it's easy for it to collect and then get kind of it just kind of attaches to the instrument, it becomes sticky, and it can, you can remove it, but it's, it's better for the varnish if it just doesn't happen, okay? And that's basically the, the daily maintenance you're gonna use. So just get the rosin off the instrument and you're good to go. My advice always is to rent first. Cellos are, are totally different though you know you some have a dark character some are bright some are loud some are mellow and most likely there's going to be a type of instrument that you know calls to you that, like that's how i want my voice to sound the more the longer you've played you're you're going to know more about what you want out of an instrument and so by renting first you kind of get those initial months out of the way you don't have to commit to anything and then you you've you're kind of going into this purchasing game with more knowledge. Another advantage of renting first, especially if you find a kind of a local, you know, brick and mortar shop you can rent from, uh, is that if there is an issue with the cello, you can take it back and you can have it fixed. You can maybe switch the rental out. For cellos at a lower price point, let's say the ones that you might order off Amazon for say three to $500, oftentimes also uh, they come and, and you set it up and you follow all the instructions and then through no fault of your own, the cello might actually not be very playable because you know the bridge doesn't fit properly or there's an issue with the string height. If you rent from a violin shop, they're gonna be set up by you know a violin shop. So it's an expert setting it up so that it's playable and that it's, you know, and if there is a problem, you can take it back. Um, 
I've had a couple situations where a student of mine, when they you know, came to me for the first time, they were telling me how frustrated they were about the sound they were making, and then I saw the cello, and I was like, There's, this is not your fault. Like This would be hard for anyone to make a decent sound on. It was just not set up for success. I'm, I'm sure every instrument needs to be set up for success to really, for you to be able to make a beautiful sound, but the cello in general you know, the, we, our bridge is so tall and the strings are so heavy and there's so much string tension that it, it really is a problem. If, for example, the bridge is too tall and the string height is way too high, you can very quickly develop like a, a tendon injury from trying to work through a string height that's just way too high to be playable. So it's, it, some instruments maybe you could kind of like, oh, you know, this guitar, these are bad strings and whatever, but I'm kind of, I'm figuring this out, I'm learning how to play guitar. Cello, it's very important that it's set up ideally. My opinion is that if you're a beginner, especially if you're not already, you know, kind of, you don't have like a, a thorough musical background, definitely use tape, okay? I've seen cellos where, you know, it looks almost like a tiger because there's, you know, 12 stripes of tape going all the way up the neck. I wouldn't do that if it were me. What I um, advise beginners to do is just three tapes, three thin strips of tape, okay? Um, I have a video actually explaining how to, you know, put on the tape, but, and it would just be for first position and it, it demarcates across the strings where your first finger would go, where your third finger would go, and where your fourth finger would go. This is kind of a contentious argument that you, you'll see back and forth on forums for adult learners. The argument against tape is that you need to be ear driven, okay, and you need to be able to hear if you're in tune or not and not rely on tape. That's true, but if you're like I was, I came into cello from scratch, I had no ear training, and my ear was not naturally super refined, it, it would have been the blind leading the blind without a little bit of help from tape because you have to have an ear that's good enough to hear a problem for you to fix it. Okay, so, so it can be putting the cart before the horse a little bit if you don't use the tape, okay? If you feel like, you know, I don't, I just don't think I need the tape, by all means, don't use it. But I think it's a huge help. Um, the reason I don't use, I don't advise like a ton of pieces of tape is that after this first position is kind of squared away and you're using the tape to, in the very beginning, to like learn how to shift to second position, third position, by that point, I think you should remove the tape, okay? So it's like a crutch with a broken leg. Very, very helpful while your leg is healing, but it will actually slow you down if you don't ditch the crutches once your leg is healed, okay? And you wanna build up that leg muscle. So use the tape at the beginning, in my opinion, but then get rid of it as soon as you're shifting and you feel pretty comfortable in the lower neck positions. This is a complicated question because I don't want to crush people who just want to get started right away. If I had to pick the best time to learn vibrato, it would be after you're comfortable shifting in the lower neck positions because the vibrato motion, as I learned it and as I would say most cellists do it, is, is used, it's a, it's a, you know, kind of a pumping in the forearm that's exactly the same motion you use when you're shifting. So if you're already used to shifting, it's going to help you learn vibrato. Vibrato is one of those things that once you can do it, it can help you actually relax because you need to be relaxed to do it. But as you're learning it, it's very easy for everything to tense up extra because you're, you know, for, trying to force it. Okay, that, trust me, that was definitely how I experienced it for years before I got comfortable playing with vibrato. Th that's why I think it can be a, not a problem, but it can slow you down if you try to jump into it too early, just because now you're, you know, it's, you're probably a little tense to begin with, and then you're adding this, this kind of motion that's not comfortable yet, and it adds even more tension. Okay, that, that would be my reason not to start vibrato while you're only still in first position. Having said that, if you just want to feel like, I just want to get started in, to some degree, I have these, uh, right here, I have my, my learn vibrato in four steps and they're preparatory exercises. Those, on their own, you could practice right away. They're great exercises. They can even, you know, if you do them diligently and you don't rush the process, they can actually help kind of promote flexibility in the, hand, in the fingers anyway. 
even regardless of um, vibrato. I do think those exercises will go a little more smoothly from the start if you're already shifting. But if you just want to give it a stab, I'd say go ahead. Just, you know, vibrato, it's so hard to say this because <laughs> it's not what I did, but it's kind of like enjoy the journey and like slow is fast when it comes to progress. If you just focus on mastering the steps, it will start to happen. If you just try to make it happen right away, it's probably just going to end up in a whole bunch of tension. That's my experience. This is a good question that I, I notice a lot of books, you know, kind of beginner etude books, keep you in first position throughout the whole first book. And then maybe in this, you know, second book, for example, I believe Suzuki book two, you start shifting, but book one is completely in first position. Me personally, when I work with adult learners, I try to get them shifting a little earlier than that. Um, just because I think for adult learners, there's kind of a psychological element of terra incognita, kind of unknown territory. And if we spend a whole bunch of time getting super comfortable in first position only, and then once that's completely comfortable, you start learning these other positions, it, the disparity can feel kind of daunting. So what I try to do is wait till the student is pretty comfortable in first position, and then we just launch into second position, third position, fourth position, basically the lower neck positions. Um, I use Rick Mooney's book, Position Pieces. It's fantastic. It's the shifting book to use, in my opinion. Um, and yeah, I would say dive in pretty early. Don't, don't wait too long. What I would say is, in my experience, every time I leveled up instruments, especially in the beginning, like going from a, a rental cello to the first, you know, cello I owned in the, like say the the two to three thousand dollar range it got so much easier to play so if I think when you decide that okay I'm in this I want to learn this this is like I'm, I'm gonna go for this if that's three months down the line six months down the line I think it's a pretty good idea to start thinking about purchasing equipment it's just it really helps so much, it, it, it does. The other thing to think about is that if you are um, following my advice and you're renting, at a certain point, every month you rent is just another, unless you're renting to, to own in a situation like that with a shop, every month's rent is just more money you're paying that you're, but you don't own the instrument. So if it's been six months, a year, a year and a half, I, and you are loving cello and you just are super excited, I would definitely start shopping around if it's in your budget. I think it's important to think of the cello as sort of like a limitless horizon and to instill early on that you are capable of pretty amazing things if you put in consistent work, okay? You know, if you're starting out and you're like, I want to be professional, that's what happened with me. I was like four weeks in, you know, my teacher made an offhand remark like, wow, you're learning so fast. Like, maybe you could even be professional one day and it just like, boom, da, okay, I got permission. Even though I don't even know if she's serious, I'm running with it, I'm obsessed with this. And if I had thought like realistically, I don't think I would have let myself dream of getting to a professional level because it just, you don't hear about it that often. So I think in terms of goals, you should set lofty goals and you should think about how great it would be to reach those goals and then you should work towards them. Setting realistic goals is, and by that I mean just kind of like lowering the, the goal to a level that seems achievable and that you won't be a failure. Setting a huge goal, if that's what you really want, that's gonna motivate you more and you're gonna get further anyhow chasing a big goal, okay? So I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that and I think it's a great thing to do. Um, I think more adults are more serious about the cello than they let on and, and they feel a little embarrassed by how passionately they feel and how, how good they want to be. I think you should embrace it. And then, then it's a question of, you know, working hard, getting the right information um, and just kind of setting smaller goals and working towards them and just, you know, enjoying the journey and, and progressing, okay? But 
that's the biggest thing. I, I don't even think like realistically when you hear that word, just what's your goal? What would, what's that dream you have? And then you just start, you know, okay, what's the first step? And you just <laughs> keep step by step and you can get to some pretty crazy places by doing that. All right, there you go. That's a kind of a comprehensive question and answer covering all the basic questions for beginning your cello journey. If you enjoyed this video and it helped you, please consider subscribing to my channel. I'd really appreciate it. See you next week. Thank you.